Welcome all. Встреча экспертного экспертного Ways to avoid the information bubble. Our speakers of the day include Andrei Vardamatsky, PhD in social studies, founder and director at Novak Laboratory. Hello, Andrei. Hello. Oksana Sherist, PhD in social studies, senior analyst with the Center for European Transformation, head of the uh, Voice of the Streets projects. Uh, hello, Oksana. Hey, nice to meet you. Gennady Korshunov, former head of Institute of Sociology of uh, Belarusians. Uh, National Academy of Sciences, PhD in Social Studies. Hello, and Wojciech Konanchuk, Deputy Director of the Center for Eastern Studies, OSW Warsaw. I wish to remind you that there is simultaneous interpretation available. So, if you're having any, if you have an easier time following this in English, please make for, make sure you select the appropriate uh, language track in Zoom settings following the globe icon. Now I also wish to record. Uh, I wish we wish we wish to recall you that there is a recording going on. Uh, the Chatham House rule, our uh, rules are applied uh, with previous notification. If you want to say something off record, to, to stay off the record, please make sure you say that before you say something secret that you would not like. You, you don't want to record it. For those watching us on YouTube. Please subscribe to our channel, get us more likes, because this is the way to get more views for the video that you liked. The co-hosts of the day include Valeria Kostegova and Vadim Mazeyka. Hello, guys. The floor is yours, Vadim. Hey, once again, thank you, Anton. Uh, the topic of the day is the continuation. Well, so it's basically a sharp necessity, acute necessity in sociology uh, these days in Belarus, because over the past five, ten years, uh, these half decade, decade have been quite tough for independent social studies, including, well, particularly independent social studies, sociology in Belarus. There are many obstacles uh, that it has been facing before the crisis, with the current crisis in mind. Given the current crisis, uh, well, it's even a tougher challenge, and there is more request, uh, higher request, high demand among the public uh, for public opinion surveys. Golos, uh, this initiative, the Voice of the Streets, uh, Chatham House, OSW, uh, the Voice, uh, the, the Voice Initiative, Chatham House, OSW, represented by Voice today, they have been trying to fill that gap. We also see that uh, the authorities, particularly before this old Belarusian. National Assembly, they also wanted to use uh, the social studies, uh, but uh, whether the tool for propaganda or the actual tool for research, we will discuss that today. We could definitely discuss uh, the things, the piece of research that have been happening over the past years, uh, over the past months. So before we engage into the discussion, let's uh, see what kind of facts have we learned uh, about the Belarusian society uh, because of those social polls. Because many things about the awakening, the uh, emergence of or activization of various social groups, it has become visible even without surveys. But for, for the skeptics, it was very important to make sure that we Belarusians, we researchers um, should uh, leverage polls to get knowledge out to people. So I suggest we proceed according to the agenda, as the announcement goes, in the same order uh, of speakers. So, uh, Andrei Vardamaski, Mr. Vardamaski, Andrei, hello, you have the floor. So what are the key findings uh, that we've learned uh, about the Belarusians uh, from, the, from the opinion polls? The social studies fruit, the outcomes over the past six months, what has it given, what, what has it been like? Thank you for the floor. Thank you for the interest uh, and the demand for social studies. Uh, the, the, the topic that you've identified is indeed very acute, very relevant. We've learned so much about our society in second half of 2020. And I will try to be concise, to be brief, uh, to say uh, to, to voice five to seven points uh, that we've learned. The first point 
the phenomenon of explosive rating explosive rating phenomenon this happened multiple times in 2020 with with uh, several personalia that emerged mr tikhanovsky mr babarika mrs tikhanovsky uh, these are the key personalia that have features of, that are the hallmark of this phenomenon from zero to skyrocketing growth in, in case of Svetlana Tikhanovska, this is a textbook example indeed, where the dynamic is like angling up at 45 degrees, zero to very high. Same happened to her husband, uh, Sergei Tikhanovsky, same happened to Mr. Babarika, the ex-candidate, the unregistered candidate. So we've, we've uh, noticed that multiple times. Uh, this is the need of the society for the new personalia. Second point, a complete overhaul, complete change in the media behavior. Two parameters to be voiced here. The first parameter, the first feature, the traditional hierarchy of Russian media comes first, then the state media in Belarus, followed by several years and for many years this has been going on followed by the independent uh, trust media index uh, was the, the non-public media non-state media so independent media have been least trusted this has been completely overhauled this the, there was a complete paradigm shift uh, back in june july there was a huge spike in trust, uh, more trust uh, to independent media, non-state-run. Non the confidence in them skyrocketed. This process has been going on with various fluctuations. Now the situation is like this. Uh, the state media are ranking, well, in the system, in the system of coordinates, uh, trust media index for the state. Uh, media is basically below zero. That's the first point. Second point, uh, the change of functionality of the media. I mean, people switched uh, to all kinds of chats, all sorts, all, all levels of chats, which is how this media basically switched their functionality. They ceased being the sources of information, they started being a, a, a manage, management tool. So these processes, uh, we've seen them happen. A lot has been said about the horizontal ties. This was another explosive process where instead of eight or ten points of communication, people would have three dozens, four dozens of points of communication. In this case, these, these two functions are exit, well, manifested, the information and uh, man managerial function. The horizontal met the vertical, and, well, it started being a bit shaky. That's as for the general populace. Now, let's talk about the protest movement, the protesters, uh, a whole lot new features whole new features have emerged that have not been uh, visible in the previous uh, times of protest. The pain threshold has moved, where back in the day, 15 days of uh, short-term sentence imprisonment was uh, very short, it was uh, not scary. You remember, Mr. Tikhanovsky would say that uh, life does not end there, it's not so critical, it's not uh, too bad. Now it has become the norm. So the pain threshold shifted. This was how the race was running, this elevation of the pain threshold and uh, the elevation of the extent of the level of the reprisals, of the oppression. So the, the point where we are, this, this is exactly the outcome of this race. Second feature of the protester, protesters' behavior, it's long-term protest, now is, the fo now is in focus. You remember December 2010, when Minsk was empty the next day after that protest, uh, the apathy prevailed. These days, society has drawn a conclusion from this situation. 
that uh, well, it takes more and more times going out to the streets, taking to the streets uh, than once. Uh, long term is months and possibly a year of this protest activity. This is what I mean by long, longer term. And the bulk of the protesters, up to 80 percent, are looking at this uh, long term protest. And this is a social psychological norm these days. The third feature of the protesters, lack of the need for the physical presence of the leader, as it used to be the case pretty much at all times in all countries, in Poland, in Dudei, Lech Walensa, Viktor Yushchenko in Ukraine, Vladimir Lenin, way back in the day, the Finnish train station on the armored personnel carrier, and so on. Now, people understand the situation. They, hence, they simply don't exhibit this demand. They do not require the physical presence of the leaders. And this is one of the manifestations of the self-organization, which is about this exactly. Each time, in every particular place, if you will, in every, on every protest day, there's a new leader sparking up who is like that, who, who acts in that capacity for two or three hours, and then they come back a regular guy, regular guy or girl next door. In the morning, they, they were also the regular guy next door, but for the, for the two or three hours, they were the, the, the leaders of the protest. So this floating leadership or fluctuating leadership phenomenon, this is what we've come to see. Another particular demand, which also differentiates Belarusian protests, distinguishes Belarusian protests, Protest as a need. The functionality of protests uh, uh, in the world is negative to say no, to say no to economic policy, to medical, or to the level of the standard of medical care, educational standards, and so on and so forth. The Belarusian protest was typical and was like this until November, November ish. The people took to the streets not because they wanted to say no. They wanted to get positive energy. They wanted to get positivity from people around. People standing next to them, right, right next to them. And the final point, just to make it not too long, the social composition of the protesters, completely unique features, social demographically. One of them being that uh, in the structure of protesters, the number of youth aged 18 to 29 is the same percentage-wise, 18 to 20 percent, as the people who are 56 plus. So this is unique, the same, same proportion. If we will, again, unique compared to other protest uh, movements. And the final bit is the educational level of protesters. If the educational level of the population is one, if baseline is one, then the educational level, the level of education of protesters is 1.3. So they're more educated than the general populace. On average, the educational level of protesters is higher than the average Belarusians. I have the figures uh, to, to corroborate that, so let me call it a statement. Okay, thank you, Andre. Just very briefly, you were talking about the manager, managerial functionality of the media. Could you please uh, elaborate? In the chats, uh, the, the media, what exactly were, were you referring to by this information and managerial, the managerial function? Could you describe that? Yeah, there is this temporal thing going on. Uh, people are obtaining information online. At that same moment, when something happens in the street, a person can get this information right there, right then. And if it happens right then, and this is a brand new emotional motivator, emotional motivator, which is different than if a person had gotten the same valid, the same objective information, but post factum, if they got it the next day. And it's too late to 
put on your raincoat, shorts, t-shirt, whatever the case may be, and to take to the street. Since it's contemporaneous, so diplomatically, it's a managerial function. Uh, well, put more simply, it, this is the force that dragged people out of the street. Their own willing. They, all, they wanted to take to the street. The motivation was, you're not supposed to just get out for the sake of getting out. Me as a citizen, I'm obliged to do that. Not the case. The motivation, the motivator was this. I have to take to the streets and I, and I must do that because I cannot do, do a different thing. So like Lev Tolstoy said, you should marry not when you want, but when you can't avoid getting married, when you can't tolerate not being married. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I believe we should give the floor to Oksana Sherist. Uh, Oksana, you've been dealing with the Voice of the Streets project, uh, among other things. Uh, you've also learned quite a lot for yourself and for, for the sake of uh, all of us uh, about the protesters. You, you've learned uh, a great deal. What are the key findings that we've uh, been able to pick up because of social studies? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, more like it. Uh, to all of you, well, I will start with a mini protest of my own. The social studies were reduced to, to polls, like uh, talking about the date of the poll, the method and the sample. I, I, I Just a, a caution to everyone. I will not be able to do that. I will not be able to give you that, uh, well, neither would my colleagues. The information that we've been collecting and we can interpret as uh, sociologists, uh, it's not exactly well, uh, the polls in the situation of today are quite limited uh, from the informational viewpoint. There are so many restrictions, there are so many limitations. So this puts additional requirements on the interpretation and on the understanding of what exactly we're getting in for one. So I'm going to be referring not to just polls, opinion polls, I'm also going to be referring to the observations and the voice of the streets projects. It's not a mass poll, not exactly representative, we don't claim it to be that, but it's analyzing the local media, uh, local chats, uh, telegram channels. It's one of the ways uh, to uh, look into the protest moods. Analysis of mass communication, there's, uh, there's no new, new, new platforms, including telegram. I believe that any conclusions or constatation of the facts, uh, they should be based on most important things. Normally, you cannot just uh, go by a single figure and uh, by a very honestly uh, held poll. Well, today, something I feel like the most discussing today about 2020 Belarusian features, is a, the part of these discoveries is, is not just uh, 2020. It's just in 2020, we only learned some things we didn't know about the Belarusian society. And this is how we determine the nature of the Belarusian revolution and the processes under, underlying it. Well, first of all, the protest did not start on the 9th of August, on the voting day. It started before, in springtime, uh, when there was political mobilization, activization. Well, people became politically active. Uh, this goes, uh, this says a lot. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, that our research, the, the mid-2020 uh, is when the Belarusian revolution started, is the issues of the integration, deepened, deepened, deepened integration with Russia since uh, 2019, and the failed informational policy of the Belarusian regime with the corona crisis. So these were the triggers in mid-2020 that basically sparked the revolution. If we were to look into deeper de definitions, so into long-term prospects, longer-term prospects, I would say that the process that we've been observing, or at least the first stage of the Belarusian revolution that we were uh, looking at in uh, summer, fall, and winter 2020, this is a revelation, this is, this is, a, this is a revolution, this is a discovery. And I was amazed by that when we were running polls in uh, August, September, uh, we were well, asking people around in the streets. Well, when 
the main factor that caused people to take to the streets, apart from the obvious triggers with the political campaign, the violence in the streets, it's all clear. But apart from that, the main important factor was the impossibility to develop. The people saw no way to develop. For many people, uh, the Belarusian political system, the state system, has become a constraining factor for their plans, their prospects, their projects that they saw bef before them. And this was quite obvious, so not just for the IT guys, but all, not the creative, creative people, but for pretty much everyone. I mean, kindergarten teachers, uh, workers at state-owned uh, state enterprises, they told us that, who even in their activities, even, even in their domain of life, they face these constraints. Let's remember how it started. Let's remember the underlying things. And again, what are the determinants of the nature that, uh, well, it's uh, technical, the Russian revolution was technical, technological, ways of political mobilization that we've seen. Well, it's uh, not exactly social studies, but political sciences, poly political technology analysis, but uh, still we've seen that. Uh, the, immediate manifestations in this period period of 2020 just a couple points uh, from me because andre has said many important things uh, for me already the divide in the society is always interesting it's always uh, people are trying to figure out who has the majority the majority is uh, not too the majority is the inertia rather than the locomotive, the driver of changes. But everyone wants to know where the majority is. Not a single poll, no matter how well organized, uh, it's not give us, it's gonna give us uh, an answer. But since, uh, well, late last year, some of the studies uh, have been summarized, uh, some of them public, some are not. Looking at the most recent Chatham House research uh, opinion poll, it is safe to say that uh, there is a division of the Belarusian society into three parts, uh, which are not exactly equal, but, uh, well, they're, they're comparable. I mean, there, there is a parity of powers. We can give crude estimates uh, for uh, the support of the regime. Quite crude estimates would be 20, 30 percent of people supporting the regime. It's consistent proponents of change, the same proportion. 30 to 40 percent, give or take. And among them, there are people who are bystanders, commentators, audience, no matter how you spin it, no matter which label you slap on them. So getting back to the second part of my points, uh, the dynamics is very important. Uh, Chatham House uh, opinion polls are very good because they have a monitoring bit and they can they enable us tracking the dynamics of many things. What's most important, what's important to understand, in my viewpoint, is that uh, since late September, when the until January, the three waves of this polls, of this research, uh, the moods are not changing, virtually not changing. The moods, the triggers that caused this protest uh, to spark in August 2020, they, there's little change in them. That means one thing. Although we are quite a bit sad about uh, the oppression of the street uh, of this against the street protesters, uh, the protest has been squashed. Uh, the protest has been quashed, but people are well, too much violence going on. Uh, but still, the people are willing to go on. The ways of manifestation of the protests uh, have changed, but the people uh, do not take this business as usual, and they don't want to go on like that. It's very important to record that. Another important point that many people are interested about, and it's, it still causes a lot of debate. So this is one of the features of the Belarusian protest of the Belarusian revolution, is the complete lack, or more or less complete lack, about uh, geopolitics uh, as a factor, uh, as content. There are no requirements, no uh, wants, no wish lists, uh, among people who are fighting for the things to change in Belarus. There are people who are completely different by their interests, by their education and so on, but the factors of the social political uh, geo, geo, geopolitics has no play in this whatsoever. 
to what you well, think. How it got there, again, it's, it takes more research because it did not happen overnight. However, these small changes in the moods, uh, well, the, the current Kremlin politics uh, basically causes uh, more Belarusians to, to think worse of Russia. But this is about it. The, geopolit the geopolitical component has not been significant, and it is still insignificant for that active part, active core of the protest. People who want development uh, rather than stagnation. And the final joking bit, just, just one minute of fun for you, if I may. The social studies uh, can basically give us the level of conviction of the government uh, in, the, in the society. That uh, last campaign that they ran, this huge poll for the so-called All Belarusian uh, People's Assembly, nobody wanted to assign the rating uh, for the authorities as 66 percent, higher than 66 percent. Even though, well, this this is a whip up show, whipped up show. Uh, the understanding of, the, of uh, actual rating, of actual support, uh, actual approval ratings by the government is quite low. They, they understand it's low. I have a lot of things to say, to elaborate, but uh, let's uh, take it to discussion, if, if there is time and wish. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Question number two, question number three. I have more points uh, coming my way. Okay, so can we move on? Gennady Korshinov. As a practicing social scientist, is also Gennad is also the person who uh, published the approval ratings of 24% in Minsk. Apart from for the apart from the 24% uh, support in Minsk that we know because of you, oh, without your arrest, that information would not have gone public. What are the other important findings uh, because of social studies that we've gained uh, less than this year? Yeah, thank you. It just all happens when you do something once, and then you you find you find yourself part of part of a history. Yeah, that, that's exactly how it happened. Yeah, that's exactly how you how we uh, got hold of you. Yes, indeed. The past year has given us a lot of food for thought, uh, not just to understand social studies. If I may. I'll go broader than that. I will not focus on the figures. I will talk more broadly what social studies is or what social studies are, because I completely agree. I second what Oksana has said. It's not really a big mistake, but uh, for a long time, the social science, uh, social studies in the country were all about the figures, the headcount, the figures. It's like these are the questions get, get us the answers. This is this is how sociology used to function. This definitely affected the image of sociology on its uh, features and so on. It was detrimental. However, what I can say is that it's not just the issue of sociology. That's the issue of the Belarusian humanities as, at large. How far will we go beyond the policy paper? How far? Beyond that, can we do that? Five, seven points, uh, important points. Uh, preventative authoritarianism. Uh, well, uh, well that, that's, that's about it. We, we cannot go, go, go broader than that, the social scientists. It's very difficult in the turbulence we find ourselves ourselves in the middle. It's very difficult to generalize. It's very difficult to generalize at all. I believe that uh, we should not just be monitoring the situation. It's not just about that. Well, I definitely believe all of my points. Uh, the concept I was going to voice today, uh, well, my own beliefs uh, preclude me from doing that. Uh, monitoring itself is not enough. Uh, Chatham House, separate thank you, kudos to you guys. Because this year has shown us the pace of social dynamics, the pace of social dynamics uh, that the, the modern society exhibits. It's very difficult to forecast 
because the pace is, is neck breaking. In this case, it's not the specific figures that we, sh we should be looking at. It's, it's uh, that case where figures deceive. You should interpret the trends. You should interpret uh, the dynamics. Everybody must have been looking at that, but most important for me, uh, this year, or more like last year, uh, the biggest impact was by the data of uh, World Value Survey. This is the evidence of how big paradigm shifts have happened in axiology. It's very difficult to understand when the processes started that ultimately triggered this Belarusian revolution, Belarusian protest wave. It's definitely not the August 9th, where it, where it all started. It all started way before uh, the electoral campaign. If not for those processes that have been going on dormantly, we would not have seen the people uh, running as candidates uh, that we've seen. It's late 2019 that has had a role to play, but I believe it started a whole lot earlier than that. Uh, well, it still needs a lot of development and assessment. This uh, worldview transformation that happened in the Belarusian society over the past, I would say, five to seven years. There's economic features, the economy, cultural transformation. Now I'm looking at migration patterns, uh, the study of migrants. This time frame of five to seven years back, or time frame of five to seven years, it has been critical. There have been paradigm shifts. This paradigm shift started uh, happening back then. We should dig deeper into that. Now for the roles, uh, for the role of uh, social studies and humanities at large, I would like to focus on uh, on the fact that we underestimate the constructive transforming force, the constituent force of, uh, of the humanities. Yes, we are in the process. Yes, it's still too difficult to analyze uh, right now, a crosscut, a snapshot. But the mission of science is to know, to, to, to foresee and to, to foresee to manage. The sociological vision, so, 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 sociological approach, it's, it's a necessary component of the efficiency of the... And in this case, there's another problem that you, that you run into all the time, is the level of sociological competence of Belarusian society. Yeah. It's a major challenge in terms of sociological education. It has been compressed uh, to the point of well, be beyond the point. But this is where we get to talk about the task at hand, not the problem. The sociological competence, the social studies as a knowledge, we need to popularize that. We need to embed, we need to realize this potential. It's, it's definitely not just about the figures. Because what I've been talking, what I've been saying about social studies, the competence, sociological competence, is the necessity to recontemplate, to reevaluate the social baggage that we were carrying until 2020 and onwards, and this uh, toolkit of uh, informational toolkit that we have right now, that we can leverage. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gennad. Yes, indeed, the problem with social competencies, we're not thinking about the sociological education sometimes, but uh, I get this recollection when I was teaching students at the university back in the day. Well, I, I tried uh, to imply the logic uh, 
some some logical concepts uh, that the students were supposed to get, but it was not part of the curriculum. And ultimately, yeah, it's it's, it's not like it, it's it's not there. For this reason, yes, you need to exp explain it to them from from scratch, from from zero. Last but not least, Voice uh, Kanamchuk, I would like to talk to you about. Well, definitely beyond the survey, beyond the opinion poll itself. We, we've learned quite conceptual things because of social studies. Could you talk about this phenomenon of interest towards Belarus? Clearly, Andrei Vardamaski has been dealing with this, has been dealing with social studies uh, in the Belarusian domain for years now. Then the for OSW for the Eastern Studies uh, Center this is uh, not not conventional product. So ca can you give us your outlook as to how social studies perceive the Belarusian society? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to start from this. From the viewpoint of sociology, Belarus is possibly the least uh, studied country in Europe. So we should know that, we should remember about that because of many political constraints, limitations, independent sociology in Belarus is undesired. We know more about the Putinist Russia uh, than about Belarus. For me as a researcher of the Eastern Europe, not just Belarus, for me as a researcher, it boggles me when I compare the sociological studies that we have on hand on Ukraine, about Russia, and on Belarus. Belarus is the least studied. You asked me this question, where is the interest to Belarus is coming from? Where is it coming from? Well, it's an important uh, country in the region. It's a neighbor of Poland, in part. Uh, we've been around, our center, always doubly, has been around for more than three decades, and particularly we've been dealing with Belarus from day one. Uh, last year, we decided to order sociological studies, uh, and I, I believe it's it's uh, part of the picture. We also wanted it was supposed to happen. We wanted to learn things for ourselves. It's not because uh, the Belarusian social studies is dead. It's not. It's not dead. It, it's there, and the past year has proved that uh, Belarusian sociology exists. Now the big question is about the extent, the size of it. We decided to order that uh, opinion poll to commission that opinion poll because uh, we well we made it public it, it wasn't just for our internal use we wanted to learn more about the Belarusian society all of us understand that social studies is not some golden tool that can bring us the answers to, to any question out there definitely not the case social studies is one of the tools to study the society it's an important one but it's, it's just one of them for me, as a citizen of my country, as, as, a, as a voter, I get sociological knowledge, social studies knowledge, uh, multiple times a week on various issues. We have a whole lot of research institutes, which are definitely, well, they should be taken critically, like, like pretty much everything in the world. But it's uh, thanks to the social studies that we can understand more. But it's again, it's 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 not to say this is not to say that we can foresee the future because of sociology. Sociology is there to help us understand the society better. I would like to say a bit more to focus more on the main conclusions from that poll that we've commissioned. But to that end, or before I do that, I would like to highlight a very interesting opinion poll that has gone unnoticed, largely unnoticed, the way I see it. This, this, was a, this, this was the poll by Global Voices in Belarus. They commissioned it in January. For some reason, they only published it uh, uh, in September, after the events uh, that you know better than me. Uh, two questions, not all of them, but, but two are fundamental. They've asked uh, Belarusians a question. Which political system is the best from is the best from your opinion? Okay. Half the Belarusians under 45 said that the Western democracy is the best. People over 45 say the Soviet system. 
Virtually no one says Lukashenko system. Virtually no one says or Putin system. I believe this has, goes a long way to demonstrate that there are very interesting changes in the Belarusian society. Another important question that Global Voices have asked, and this is available in the website, you can, you can check it out. Where do you get your information? Where do you get your facts? The resources for information. And again, folks under 45, they get the information not, on the, not from the TV, they get it from social media and from internet, from the internet. This tells you things, right? I believe many of us have uh, paid attention. There was no electoral campaign for the regime. You know, Lukashenko was just touring the military units. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a milestone event. And of course, uh, the government runs their own sociology. They also understand that there are very interesting things, very interesting changes happening in the Belarusian society. They, they do understand. I believe that uh, these changes are not natural. They are because of the demographic trend. If we uh, pick elections of 2010 as a baseline, this, this decade from 2010 to 2020, more than a million Belarusians got a voting right. 1.1, 1.2 million Belarusians got voting rights. And the similar number of people, well, they died naturally. So the new voters have a different value system as a, uh, compared to their parents, compared to that of their parents. This definitely affects uh, the value system of the Belarusian society. Answering the question more directly, the most important conclusion for me of the Belarusian, from the Belarusian sociology for 2020 is that uh, the Belarusian society is changing. And it's, uh, this cha uh, it is changing very rapidly. It didn't start on August the 9th. It manifested after the August, August the 9th. Maybe it didn't come as a surprise, as a shock to, to, all, to everyone. But what we've learned about Belarusians on August the 9th after August the 9th, it did not start there. This process is much more lengthy, is much deeper than somebody might have thought it was. I would like to finish my intervention by three important conclusions, the way I see it, of course, from the studies commissioned by us. There are three important points, three very important points that uh, tell a lot of interesting things about the Belarusian society. First point, slowly but surely, there are changes in the perception uh, of Russia. I will agree with Ms. Shevest here that the Belarusian protest, the Belarusian street is not a geopolitical one. It's, it's not driven by geopolitics. Geopolitics is not even on the back burner. It's, it's, it's not even on it doesn't play any role. It's, it's, it's not in the back seat. For the Belarusians, uh, Russia is friendly, is a close country for many reasons. But nonetheless, about 42% of Belarusians believe Russia to be the biggest threat to the territorial integrity of the, of the country. That's an interesting fact, right? An interesting finding. In case of Poland, in case of uh, Lithuania, it's about 20%. Uh, they believe that uh, Lithuania, Poland, and the West uh, is a threat to the territorial integrity of Belarus. And that's despite what the pro propaganda has been doing. They are spinning this uh, conspiracy theory uh, that the, it's, it's the Western countries uh, who are trying to uh, instigate this revolution in Belarus. Mm, another important point, the migration patterns change. In Russia, traditionally, there was uh, migration to Russia. Russia was the key place where Belarusians went uh, to earn money, to study, to, to, to find some work. What we've learned from this poll is that for over 40% of Belarusians, it's Poland that is the main country where they wish to go to, uh, in, in terms of immigration. Ranked second by the Western Europe. 
and only then followed by Russia for 30 percent of Belarus of Belarusian citizens only for 30 percent of Belarusians uh, uh, Russia is the the place they want to go to because we know that migration is not just about the economy it's also a matter of uh, political factors another important one the, 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 the question that we asked about the historic legacy this historic legacy that Belarus should appeal to is not the Soviet Union although it might seem to you that way is the great duchy of Lithuania the great duchy of Lithuania is the big is the big is the most most important point when people think back about the Belarusian historic legacy up to 40 percent of Belarusians believe the great duchy of Lithuania to be the most important Belarusian historic legacy for 28 percent this is the Soviet Union and basically it shows well you can say that well it's like this because in the Belarusian textbooks uh, the great Dutch of Lithuania has appeared quite a long time ago since the beginning of this of, of last year oh, so since uh, the, since the year 2000 the fact that Belarusians can actually see uh, Mir, Nesvish uh, and other uh, castles historic landmarks that date back to uh, Great Dutch Lithuania and Resh Pospolita. Well, they can also draw conclusions, draw conclusions based on that, based about legacy. Well, since time is going on, let me let me stop there. Yes. Time goes on. Okay, thank you. Yes, we come to recollect this time and time again about the historic legacy. We should get together at some point. We should, we should summarize everything that has happened, this Belarusization that uh, has happened, and this uh, stuff that's happening now, how it affected the perception of historic legacy. But uh, we're not there yet. Let's get back to our original questions and let's discuss these new formats of new formats of research. Because as uh, people have said, as Wojtek has said particularly, Belarus uh, is and has been in unfavorable conditions. The authorities were trying to use the licenses uh, to limit this social studies, but at some point it's no longer well in the in these conditions this public licensing is uh, devoid of any common sense when Chatham house when the osw center for eastern studies uh, they wanted to run a poll they just went ahead and got their results the authorities were defeated in a way well it's a uh, kind of a more space better space for unregulated activity at the same time there's a big question mark these new formats how well do they allow us to operate more freely and to learn about the Belarusian society better other than that there are issues like internet only that's a restriction and virtually exclusively urban population that's a limitation not the restriction so there was a abnormally high percentage of people who can speak English which was much higher than the country average by several times it was an abnormal finding the big question is these new formats how do they give us a broader look on the one hand on the other hand is it likely for us uh, to be in that information bubble how likely are we to end up there I would like to offer these questions uh, to Mr. Vardamaski first talk about methodology uh, the broader public uh, find it interesting to pick up the hottest figures first but we want to talk about the methodology more let's talk about the way this methodology transformations are they good are they more bad what are the risks 
What risk do, do they hold? My mic is on, right? Yeah. Ну как бы тут поступает большое количество исследований с разных полюсов. Well, there's quite a lot of research, pieces of research from various poles. Uh, I can identify three directions where these uh, poles are coming from. Например, вот исследование, которое условно можно назвать всебелорусский социологический опрос. One of them is provisionally speaking the all Belarusian sociological online uh, sociological poll opinion poll the Chatham House in the second direction and there is a big amount of uh, polls uh, from abroad that are commissioned by foreigners uh, that uh, does not take any licenses to run in this respect I would like to start uh, from the positivity social studies is like internet you cannot stop it there's no way of stopping it in the world of today the polls can be done even if you're in, in Antarctica, Antarctica, in, in the red tent. You remember that, that movie, that cult movie. All it takes is good communication tools. I mean, the, the comms, the telecommunications technology. Uh, and that's, that's the positive thing. There's no way of stopping sociology like that. So let's take it one by one, three directions. The first one, the all Belarusian sociological opinion poll. A lot has been said, emotional stuff. I don't want to express any emotions with respect there too. Now, just statement, one statement from the report, if you can remember, if you can recall it. There was a report about that and it said literally uh, the rating poll, there were three or four weak mentionings of, of newsmakers. What is that? What, is, what does it mean? So the stuff I've said before, three, four mentionings. Uh, this is, uh, this is a quote, I, I quoted that. This says that the newsmaker, most likely uh, one of the leaders, one of the opposition leaders, uh, it means that the rating is three to four hundredth of a percent. Even if we were to assume that the rating of an opposition leader is one percent equals to one percent, then for one thousand of people, uh, 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 if, if you have a sample of one thousand people, ten should say that. If ten thousand people, a hundred should have said that. Uh, the center for the uh, Central Electoral, uh, Electoral Commission said that uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's uh, uh, votes was 10.22 percent. 10,000 people, that should have been 10, uh, 1,000 uh, people saying that. The report only says three or four mentionings, three or four. How do we interpret that? Well, it's possibly the peculiarities of the electoral maths that the Central Electoral Committee runs, or oh, this is how the sample was built uh, by this company that ran that poll for the government, or it's just uh, the ways to interpret uh, the printout, the, the math, uh, the mathematical background uh, that uh, preceded that report. I had a similar episode uh, with Coca-Cola. They said a 10,000 strong poll, we want that. I said, why? And I got a very honest response. Andre, the end of the year is booming. We have the budget. We need to spend it. Otherwise, next year, Atlanta, the head office, will not give us that, that much. They, they will cut our budget because we've, we would have underspent it. So there was this very honest, very straightforward answer from them. There was another, another interesting know-how about uh, uh, the this uh, sample for the entire population and sample by enterprises uh, out of the 10,000 strong sample that they claim. How did they, how they, how they did it? Well, it's know-how. Know-how is knowing how, literally. But if you listen to it, know-how is, there's no way, know-how, there's no, there's no way of doing that. No way of 
getting a representative sample for all the country and for all the enterprises. Another important, uh, that uh, company that exists, that, that ran that poll, it, it, knows, it's, it knows every sociological whiff, uh, every sociological fart, I beg my uh, metaphor here, uh, they know everything that's going on in the social studies. Uh, there was no information from the field that something fishy was going on. So I will not elaborate on that any further. Chatham House, another direction. The UK colleagues, there are several people who are circling be between Harvard and the UK. And they're asking, what is the percentage of educational people, uh, educated people? Well, the census says this, and they're like, that statistics has uh, two times more. So there are, there are more people with higher education. So there are odds, uh, odd shifts uh, with age. Uh, there, are, there are issues with age. So I will not uh, go too much into detail in the same in, in the sampling design. We're talking about a different thing here. It's a fundamental strategic thing, strategic thing. The actual penetration rate of internet, building a sample, getting a, it's, it's important to get a sample. It's, it, it's impossible, it's impossible to get a sample. You can put together an online sample that is uh, strictly complying the formal proportion of the social, social, demo, uh, social dem demography. The adequate number of uh, women, men, uh, the, certain education, certain income level, and so on. Uh, the sample for the external reporting from the formal viewpoint will be purely socially demogra social demographically correct. However, uh, the sample also has another stratum, uh, the social psychological status. If, if it's a strictly randomized sample, if it is strictly randomized, there should be the same number of extroverts, introverts, uh, same activity levels or same level of activity, people wishing uh, to be heard by other people, their opinion to be heard by other people, and so on. And this in-depth bit of uh, sample, it's, it's impossible to hit it, it's impossible to get it, which is how we get to the shift that we get. And the argumentation that they give, it's, 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 not a, it's not just the urban population, it's, it's not just about that. It's impossible to build a sample based on that parameters even within the urban population, even inside that substratum. The logic that claiming that the rural population uh, is similar to the smaller towns uh, population by their viewpoints the smaller towns are like middle, mid, mid-sized town, mid-sized towns are like cities, cities are like Minsk, let's measure Minsk. So this is a logic uh, taken to its absolute completion. This is their logic. Many other points, many other arguments can be cited here. I will just say one thing. Uh, Gallup cannot, doesn't do this in principle, although it's a private organization that uh, counts every cent. They don't do online polls at all. Online polls uh, that uh, are aimed at decision making, be that financial, economic, or whatever, because, uh, well, you can do it quite quickly. You can do those quite quickly. They don't. The situation is very dramatic in, in sociology. We see right now, unraveling before our eyes, uh, how various cocoons are happening, and the dis destruction of everything in total. Uh, things like that happened in Belarus when the official TV uh, offered the data from various sociological service services 
So we have democracy. So here, here are the, here is the data. That data was different. It was fundamentally different, significantly different. Somebody asked, uh, well, Yuri asked me, give us the examples uh, for the rural the localities and for for the city. For Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's ultimatum, the difference was this knowing of a fact of existence uh, such an ultimatum back then around the time 33 percent of uh, urban dwellers said they they knew about it only 25 percent in the rural population so this is the difference this is the kind of difference translated into rating we understand that the the weight of the opinion uh, ballot or of the voting ballot uh, well of a grandmother who's afraid of internet and this this uh, her, her voice her voting ballot is the same as uh, with an expert with three harvard oxford and so on higher educations and with a house completely online whose house is completely online same weight this is just a, a simple example this is a dramatic situation we are on the verge of losing trust to social studies as, as an activity. This is a huge, tragic danger. And it's right there. It is happening as we as we watch it, as we're watching it. Something needs to be done about it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Andre. After a presentation as serious as that with a dr dramatic finale, uh, well, I believe that uh, other speakers might have something to elaborate on that. Uh, Wojciech, I'm sure, has something to say. People from Satyo are online with us. Maybe they would have things to say. Well, uh, I would really like to be wrong here, but yeah, we will get there. We'll get there. Let's let's uh, initiate the discussion. Uh, let's give the floor to Oksana Shreves first with the data, the online polls, the voice of the streets, uh, who, which was completely different, which was not online, but uh, asking real people right there in the streets. Oksana, what do you think? Well, apart from the things you've listed from in, in my past life, or the, the life before that, I was, I was working with social media, the classical ones. Right. So, I agree with virtually everything that uh, Mr. Vardamaski has been saying, what Andrei has been saying, with a critique, with uh, some constatations, but I'm, I'm not as tragic, I'm not as dramatic about it uh, as, as, as he describes. Let me tell you why. Let's wrap our heads around one simple concept. There are mass opinion polls, big, large-scale ones that give us uh, the mean temperature in the hospital, uh, the spread of the, the range of uh, opinions in the country, with confidence intervals, with sample errors and uh, sampling errors and so on. It's, very, it's, it's, it's impossible to run a big poll like that countrywide. Well, it's sad, but we should accept it as a fact. And it's not just about us having the accreditation with that commission on the opinion polls whether we use phone service, phone polls, or online polls, well, this kind of poll, this kind of a poll is a democratic uh, tool, a democratic toy. It's uh, studying the population's political views. It works in the situations when people are prepared to openly uh, when they are prepared to openly disclose their viewpoint, not just those who have an active stance, but every people, every person out there. It's clear that uh, this condition is never met 100%, not, not, in, not in any society, not in, not in any country. But uh, in today's situation, well, it's, uh, you, you can hope for that kind of openness, for that kind of sincerity in people less and less and less. Our access to the physical field uh, is restricted. Face-to-face uh, -face is, is off limits uh, to us. It's not available to us. Uh, that basically can get us the sampling, the, the best of the sampling method. 
extrapolating the data for the entire population for the entire country it's very difficult it's impossible andrew is right it's not about the inter inter internet penetration level it's not about the urban population or the, the rural population that we're dealing with it, it's uh, this is the principle this is the very the very essence of the sampling method because ideally every one person in your general uh, sample in in your general sum of age to, uh, on the, to 16 age to 18 they, they should have uh, equal chances of ending up as a participant in your in your opinion poll well maybe he'll oppose me when when he's given the floor but the way i understand it the way the, the way online polls work uh, there's no such thing as granting the same chance for every person to become part of the sample it, this is the conceptual difference it's not just about uh, rural settle uh, urban settlements it doesn't matter all the math is off the complexity of statistical mathematics that is based on the theory theory of probability it's very difficult to do that we, we, we cannot uh, ask 1,000 people and say that nine and a half million Belarusians think the same. Yeah, the, the, there are some points uh, that we, the phone 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 polls is uh, is the worst. It's the worst out there. Well, since I'm uh, analyzing one by one, this is the worst phenomenon, especially because of the social poli social political changes. Because if a face-to-face -face conversation is involves two people, is the symmetry symmetry of non-anonymous contact, although anonymity is granted. Online is a symmetry of anonymity. We don't see each other, and it gives us the illusion that no one's no one's is one no one is watching us as we do that poll. A phone call in Belarus is a shift towards uh, well lack of trust to a person calling you. I don't really think that until the situation changes seriously, significantly, I don't think there is a way to ask questions uh, directly related to politics. If you're asking about uh, prices, growth, economic changes, well, people will immediately link it back to politics and they, they will not answer. They will reject or they will lie. They will lie to you. So you're never going to know the truth from, from a lie. So these limitations exist. And basically, yeah, we, we, should, we, should, we should recognize that at, at this, in this political setting, uh, they are there. We should just acknowledge that. But we should not dramatize the situation either. We should really realize what kind of capacity we have. There are only what, what kind of possibilities we'll leverage. The online poll, uh, with all these claims about rep representative uh, the representativity will representative or not uh, or it's possible the chatham house has shown that there is a bias there is a there is a bias sampling bias we cannot really know how where, where it's shifted however we can still analyze the tendency it's there the tendency is uh, this this is what we can get the numbers shift the numbers fluctuate we cannot trust uh, the percentage points, uh, 30, 40 percent, give or take, how much. But we can analyze the trends from Chatham House research. We can see whether uh, the, well, people's minds change, people's opinion change. The trends are uh, much more trustworthy than the, than the figures. And this is a very important thing. Also, there are internal relations, internal connections. If we don't just want to show the broad picture in the country, we want to analyze the links of multiple factors and so on and so forth, we'll be able to do that based on that data. Having very good quality built uh, databases. I don't think we've lost the access to information. It's all about proper interpretation and proper serving it, proper presenting it. And not not try to pass off a poll which is limited, which has limited represent, representation as something full fledged. Don't pass it off as that. Don't don't claim the urban population in big cities to be like to, to be like minded as a rural population. This causes even more distrust. Um, there's enough of that going on on the part of the Belarusian society to social studies. 
So we need to study the public opinion as the opinion countrywide. There is a number of objectives, ways and means, uh, and I believe that these are the objective points. They should be analyzed, uh, not like the opinion countrywide. The so social uh, changes, the ch changes in the civil consciousness, civic consciousness, in the national consciousness, nation's consciousness, how the structuring of the new wave of the civil society is happening. Uh, what are what is the mindset on every uh, every side of this um, process? Uh, you don't have to use uh, opinion polls. If you want knowledge, if you want understanding, it's 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 more than that. It's it's much better than the infographics. Then uh, people like to borrow and to publish and claim that it's true for the entire country. Oh, I, I'll stop it there. Yes, I, I've seen uh, Filip Bukanov uh, wishing to take the floor. Let's give the floor to Gennad Korshunov first, and then we can give the floor to Wojtek and to Filip. Uh, they're much closer to all the online polls. Uh, they can also uh, com contribute their opinions as well. I believe that the objective restrictions that Oksana has just been, objective limitations uh, that Oksana has been mentioning, they're not going away anytime soon. So for this reason, uh, the importance of, online, of uh, polls uh, is only going to grow. Uh, Gennais, what do you think about this? Are we ending up in that proverbial cocoon or, or uh, are we not? Well, point by point, briefly, to support uh, the positions, the standpoints of uh, voiced by previous speakers. I would say this, uh, it's not as bad as it could have been. Well, it's it's bad, but it's not bad, bad, bad. It's it's uh, it's okayish, okayish in the sense that uh, that there is a sufficient amount, a sufficient number of tools. There is an uh, there is an understanding of how they work. There is an understanding of the of the limitations. Uh, that comes with that or another method. I believe that it was Gallup, uh, Gallup uh, Institute of Public Opinion. They're using panel uh, opinion uh, panels. They're combining it. I believe 40% is face to face, 30% is phone, uh, and 30% is uh, online. Uh, this is uh, this is an operational setup. Another point is. We cannot assess uh, the shifts, uh, uh, the shifts uh, which are inherent to any study method, to any polling method. For example, who is uh, recording the number of rejections in face-to-face -face -to -face interviews? Well, an interviewer must do that. They must record. Well, uh, this this must is not. No, there, are, there are three people watching that uh, person who is running, who is doing the poll. Well, a couple words about online polls. I'm very interested about digitization, everything going digital, the development of digital space. The youth, uh, internet has become the main source of information for them 10 years back, I would say. For people of middle age, or provisionally speaking, it's 2016-2017 uh, because of the socio-political situation. Internet started dominating uh, the television around 20 in, uh, since around 2017, and in late in late, late 2019, uh, internet uh, has become more important uh, than the conventional media countrywide. Based on the data reportal study run together with biosocial, the number of internet users in Belarus has gone up to 7.82 million people, which is 82.8 percent of the population of all ages. Which is basically to say that, give or take, that's 95 percent of the population aged 15 plus. 15 plus. That's a huge 
shift. That's a huge spike in the in the uh, uh, that huge spike uh, to the information uh, siphon. Uh, listen, uh, listen, the statistics. Uh, Belarus uh, was number two after Iran globally. And, uh, anonymous connections since uh, since uh, 1.65 million connections uh, from Belarus. Well, the number was higher. I, I cannot re remember it off the top of my head. Four or five million, something like that. But it doesn't matter. You can you can look up the numbers anytime. It's a siphon data, the anonymizer. Comparing the online polls with the with the phone poll, with the current state of affairs, it's very difficult to, to run the phone polls. However, in the future, if these uh, polls are cell phones only, but it's it's based uh, uh, it's uh, how many how many SIM cards a person has. You need to cooperate with the uh, with the cellular carriers, uh, but uh, going digital i believe this is the future this is in the lead how do you build your sample how do you envisage controls so, well this is this is part of the methodology well that would be it for my part i will pass the floor back to the experts thank you yeah, thank you before i give the floor to voice who obviously has something to say about online polls I wish to say one of the questions in the chat here. I would like to say everyone who is uh, listing their uh, questions, uh, it's not in vain, we'll discuss it. Uh, Chatham House does not claim, uh, well, Ch Chatham House only did uh, the polls among urban dwellers. Your poll is uh, public, that's the voice. What is uh, uh, so what is the difference uh, with respect to Lukashenko approval ratings? So what, what is the difference between urban and rural dwellers? Well, first of all, it's very difficult. It's very interesting to us to listen to the discussion among Belarusian social scientists. I'm not a sociologist, practicing sociologist myself. These discussions about online phone, phone uh, polls, uh, there's, there's not, not, no discussion like that in Poland. Uh, online polls are not even considered serious so far. Before the pandemic, the main tool of opinion polls was face-to-face -face interviews or telephone interviews. However, well, I'll reiterate, before the pandemic, the online polls were not even the question, were out of the question. Well, we shouldn't judge. I, I know the limitations that exist in Belarus uh, with uh, the, the independent sociology in particular is facing. When we decided to commission our poll, we understood all the limitations that come with this, that come with this poll, given their domestic situation in Belarus. I wish to respond to uh, Yuri Drakakhrus' question about the difference uh, in opinions. Our sample was proportionate. It's representative in this respect. It's not just urban dwellers. It's uh, the rural people smaller towns, bigger uh, towns and cities. I don't have these figures uh, uh, at hand right now. What is the support approval ratings of Lukashenko among the rural population and among the city dwellers, urban dwellers, uh, cities and towns? But I believe uh, that this split uh, was seen in other, well, uh, this this division was made uh, uh, in other polls, uh, but we, did, we wanted to make ours uh, as representative as possible. Ultimately, I wish to remind that any society, first of all, first and foremost, the society like Belarusian, which is undergoing stormful changes, it's very difficult to research a society like that. I believe even in the European Union, not everybody understands that things that have happened that are happening in Belarus, these are the biggest civil unrest uh, 
uh, in Europe, one of the biggest in years uh, on the European continent, one of the largest in scale. This factor alone shows how difficult it is uh, to research, to study a society like that in a period of stormful changes like that. I think it was Mrs. Sherest or Mr. Koshinov, I cannot remember exactly. There is an understanding of limitations and the, the figures are, it's not about the figures. It's not all about the figures. The, the most important thing is the tendency, is the trend. It's the trend that matters. Yes, thank you, Wojca. In that case, uh, Philip, I believe that you've been listening to stuff about online polls. Uh, we started this one from a uh, very tough stance by Andre, then more neutral stances. Maybe you will advocate uh, pro online uh, polls uh, stance. Yes, I'm a proponent largely of online polls as a method. Thank you for granting me the floor. I'm Philip Bikanov. Uh, I was uh, affiliated with Sacho. I'm a public opinion researcher. I will agree with Oksana. I will second what Wojciech and Genais have said here. We should, uh, we should know our limitations. We should realize that the limitations exist. Of course, academically, the picture froze. Yeah, here those limitations come. Talk about limitations. Well, this is not the expert analytical club uh, limiting or curtailing the independent viewpoint. It must be the internet connection on Philip's side. So if Philip stays offline, well, well, may, I, may I contribute something while his internet is acting up. Okay, so this is a theatrical return. So uh, Philip was uh, the, trying to uh, advocate the internet and he got interrupted by internet disconnection. Oh, 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 oh I'm, I'm right back here. Well, I just wanted... Uh, I just wanted to ensure clear understanding of the word dramatic or theatrical. It's not about the limitations of online polls. It's not about Chatham House or not. It's about people interpreting the data. On the one hand, people see the data of the old Belarusian uh, poll. And on the other hand, on the other poll, uh, there is this other, all other polls. This is the cocoon I've been talking about. This is the drama. This is dramatic. This is dramatic. It's not about methodological features of online polls as such. This is the clash of this uh, flow of data. On the one hand, we have this old Belarusian survey and other data from other opinion polls, which is where the mass consciousness uh, uh, basically starts experiencing distrust to social studies at large, and not just the methodological drawbacks of any other uh, of any type of uh, poll polling. Well, that's that's a subject for other conversation. Well, that's that's what we have to live with uh, as sociologists. Yeah, I believe we will continue living. Yeah, Andrei, you have a point, but you've been quite tough uh, in terms of criticizing the online polls as a method. One of the premises that underpin uh, the, 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 the one data is wrong, the other data is wrong. Well, indeed, academically, we do have issues in terms of calculating the sampling error, uh, providing the mathematic rationale, rationale how, by how much we've uh, been mistaken, how many people listened to Lukashenko's or Tikhanovsky New Year address, 50% of what, what was the Chatham House figure, I can remember. Online is a controllable method in terms of recruiting, recruitment. Providers of online panels, uh, they know who they recruit, they control this process. By and large, how this happens. 
there is this big model happening, recruiting through online, through phone calls. Well, panels are built differently, but uh, quality panel is built like that. When we're talking about an online panel, it's not a thousand people that we're talking about who have been selected into our uh, opinion poll, God knows how, and we don't know who they represent. We're talking about 1,000 people uh, selected from a, a sample, uh, a bigger sample of 90,000 people who agreed to participate in the online panel. And they were recruited, the, 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 these 90,000 were recruited quite broadly. This model, the 90,000 people, uh, already claims uh, to be able to represent uh, the urban settlements uh, with access to internet. Urban, urban population is around 78% in Belarus. Of that 78%, around 90% have internet access. 90% of the urban population. And that's exactly, we have a quota sele selection. 99% of the cases, Chatham House also quotas uh, the number the number of people, the size of the population in a settlement. Uh, they also apply this quota. And so this is when we can say that uh, this represents uh, urban population. Not everyone will agree to, to, to participate, but also face-to-face -face is sinful in that. A rejection from a face-to-face -face is the same. No matter how you instruct the interview, interviewer, no matter how you monitor them, uh, they will not give you well, open street cluster format. Uh, there's no way of granting that uh, the right person is, is going to come and answer those questions. Rejections on, on the phone, well, on online polls, the rejection of this invitation is much lower than with phones, than with phone, phone calls. All of these methods have one and the same uh, problems uh, so online in terms of sensitivity. Chatham House, for example, it's a quite sensitive uh, story for Belarus. Online is better, and everybody claims that. The Gallup opinion poll, the Public Opinion Institute, I've given you a link on that. And the American Association Public Opinion Research, APOR, they also say they, the online panel is a good method to collect data if, if you're aware of your limitations. In, in the US, that's right, in the, in, in the US. Different mentality, different internet penetration. Andre, I see no conceptual difference in this case. If we're talking about the sensitivity, well, let me, let me finish my point. Yes, all those not speaking, all those not speaking at the same time right now. Could you please mute your microphones? Only the speaker is unmuted. There are many surveys that say that the information about the information about sensitive issues is much better, is much more quality uh, collected in a quality way. Truthful answers, uh, don't know, cannot answer, uh, much better for online than for phones. Well, you can use all kinds of sophisticated methodologies. Uh, it's objectively impossible in Belarus. This is not the subject of this conversation. The US is doing this, Gallup is doing this. I'm fundamentally disagreeing that the Belarusian society is uh, different from the American population in terms of how they use uh, the internet. Nordstadt did an opinion poll. Why people participate in the online uh, panel in the first place? They want to share their opinion. They want to. They want their opinion to be visible. And this is not different uh, from the same demands in the Belarusian society. Sociological education. That's another important story. Maybe somebody is linked to the Chatham House surveys. Um, I would like to thank them if they're present. If they're not, well, just kudos to Chatham House. It doesn't happen often. And I've been looking at these data sets. And indeed, it's scary that 60% of respondents have, high, have a higher education. 
a person who me a person who works with online all the time this is just a limitation they want to uh, represent uh, the population 60 plus in 90 percent of uh, online panel panels uh, this is not represented because there are not too many people like that senior people are less represent much less represented in the former soviet union countries so uh, if you quota uh, the education as well uh, they will simply be unable to select uh, to, to, to recruit the sample big enough this representation by education by itself is only required when there are changes between other variables and the education for the educational parameter there is a weak correlation there is a weak link uh, as to who you voted for during the elections uh, people with uh, well with vocational training uh, they are more likely to vote for, for lukashenko they did so uh, people with higher education they tend to prefer tikhanovsky uh, with stuff that i've, I've been looking at I, I cannot claim that i've um, gone through it combed it through all the way but this is a very poor way to correlate education with any other parameter for this reason, I don't think that uh, this uh, skew, this bias in the Chatham House uh, own opinion poll is a significant bias. Because the surveyors, uh, the, the, the researchers who did this poll at uh, Chatham House, uh, they say it out front that guys who understand that there is a potential, there is a, uh, there is a skew for imbalance for ed education. Of, for say about the voters for Lukashenko, possibly more people uh, voted uh, for him. So I, I guess they write it right there in their report. So in these conditions, when other methods give a non-inferior non potential for for rejections, for no answer provided, uh, the bias uh, because people are scared to answer about the questions on the elections on the phone. Well, the online panel is one of the few solutions uh, to, to, to look at the quantity. Противоборство очевидного да в обществе и в условиях конфликта. Каждый пытается как-то легитимизировать себя посредством. The obvious conflict uh, in the society today. Every part, uh, every stakeholder wants to say or wants to claim majority. And of course, these numbers are looked at. However, everyone, every single uh, opinion poll that I've seen, no. Uh, online is basically in the Chatham House only. Uh, and Narodna Pros, the popular poll, uh, they, they don't do online. Chatham House does, a, uh, so, so they, they, they give this disclaimer, there is a potential bias. So this many, this much people for the protest, this much people for, for Lukashenko. So the trends, it's axioma. You can also look at the figures, keeping in mind that there is a certain potential for bias. We should remember about that. Looking at this data, this potential is theoretically comparable, like voice study. It can be more or less, well, I understand that this is, is, is really non-academic, but according to my sensations, uh, well, how we 90% of the time have to act uh, being in Belarus, we can imagine that. I don't really believe online be non-operational. This, it is operational. This method is operational. It enables doing stuff that other methods uh, can't. And the quality of data and representation of uh, urban population with internet access is, is not not uh, that much a big limitation. With uh, rural settlements and uh, smaller towns, uh, well, there is a difference. It's difficult to pick it up. Uh, the capital city is different from from uh, smaller cities. Uh, uh, these cities are different from towns. This, uh, towns are different from smaller towns. Well, there is a significant difference, uh, but uh, not too strong. Well, it's difficult uh, to change this picture. 
saying that Lukashenko will be uh, winning by a landslide because of the rural population. It's, it's very difficult to claim that. That's, that kind of critique is unjust in terms of online data collection method. Thank you, Philip. Since we're running out of time, I would like to leave this discussion on the online panel. It's very difficult uh, to, to imagine that Philip or Andrei can convince uh, each other of, of, of the validity of their viewpoints. Uh, so let's ignore that for, for the time being. There was a question about the uh, opinion poll for the All Belarusian People's Assembly. Andrei Ordomatsky and Aksalia Shrelest have, have said a few things about this uh, poll preceding the All Belarusian Public Assembly, ABPA. Gennad, uh, how do you think? Because you've seen, you, you saw that the time was running out. Uh, do we believe this to be a, need, a much needed tool? How productive is it? Apart, apart from what Oksana has said, uh, it's uh, the, the attempt by the regime to gauge the trust in them. Well, I would say that that opinion poll was uh, uh, the attempt uh, to bring informational reinforcements for themselves, to bring in the informational reinforcements for themselves, for the government. I said it, I've wrote it, I've written about this. Uh, there, was, there was a divide brewing in Belarus since way back in time. In, in 2020, there was a clash of the two worldviews, the mundane, the actual view, and the classical, the idealistic view of the, of the, of the hierarchy, of the, of the powers that be. Essentially, the things that have, have been voiced uh, during this uh, special sociological operation, put it this way, this is uh, the attempt of the vertical of the government uh, uh, to calm themselves. Because it's very difficult to figure out, uh, at least uh, from the data that has been voiced, it's very difficult to understand methodologically where, where this opinion poll is coming from, where, what, what it's based on. It's very difficult to understand how possible it was during a month to collect and process this much data. It's very difficult to understand why they needed that much data in the first place. It's very difficult to understand, to figure out how two completely different uh, methods, uh, territorial and enterprise-based, how two sampling methods uh, play uh, along with each other. It's very difficult. Uh, how do you pilot the phone interviews and then uh, do face-to-face? -face? Well, there are too many questions. And answers. There are much more core questions than answers here. If they had something interesting and nice and beautiful, you know, they would have posted it. This is a massive research, massive piece of research. They, they, they positioned this as, as a fundamental one. Well, you would have expected more information uh, from that kind of a fundamental research about, about the methodology, about the data. Well, there is a formulation of the, of the question how it's normally done. There is a list of questions, a list of options, data on gender, data on, on ages, and so on, a huge fundamental survey. So it's very difficult uh, to formulate an opinion, to, to, to come up with an opinion about that poll uh, without that knowledge. OK, Andrea and Oksana, you wanted to elaborate on that uh, uh, massive opinion poll or the things that have been said before, they are indicative of your points. Uh, they are, you don't have anything to elaborate. Andre? Yeah, there is a search for new technology. So they've, it just, an idea came, came into their heads to work with sociological methods. Well, they didn't, they haven't done a good job. Anyway, it's, it's better than, than violence. Yeah, that's, uh, in that paradigm, it's, it's, it's better than the police baton. Everything is better than that. It's, again, I cannot uh, understand the drama that Andrei is uh, 
referring to. It's, it's nothing new that we're facing here. So some information is being peddled, uh, labeled uh, as an opinion poll. This is out and out propaganda, which is uh, an attempt to declare their viewpoint, their their stance as, as, as the one supported by the majority. It's tragic for the social studies in Belarus, but the, we've been living through this strategy, tragedy for a long time now. There was a difference between Nisep and Novak and uh, other official entities like Kaoma that is uh, waking up every, every, every time the election is coming. So now the situation is completely like this, and it is just the characteristic of the political situation. Uh, the regime feels uh, the, the deficiency of their le legitimacy. Uh, so before the, uh, apart from this all Belarusian people assembly, uh, they also wanted to, to, to run a poll before that ABPA. I will not criticize that because anymore, because the colleagues have said that. So uh, based on the information that is available about this uh, opinion poll, this is completely, this is a lot of BS. There's, there's, there's nothing you can derive of that. So I only wanted to ask one question. Who is going to put uh, the name of the company uh, that did the survey? Oh, the, the, the audibility is gone. So the biggest question that I wanted to ask is uh, who is going to claim responsibility for having run this uh, opinion poll? And this is very important, dear colleagues. One of the tragedies of social studies reputation is when there is a lack of data. Is the reputation or more like damage to the reputation of the people running the, 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 that kind of polls and people writing their names, writing their last names under it? Because not a single uh, rank and file citizen will be able to contemplate fully uh, the methodology of the, of, the, of the opinion poll. And even a, a smart person does not have uh, the access to your databases, uh, to, to your operating field, and so on. They cannot really figure out how honest and how straightforward this was done. The issue in the Belarusian sociology, the problem that we have, is that we are lacking the communication between independent com institutions who would validate in a, in a truthful manner the actions of their colleagues, thereby boosting the uh, credit of trust to the data that we publish. For laymen, for laypersons, it's very important uh, to try and uh, figure out whether they can try Gusyenko, Vardamatsky, caution of who these folks are and how can they guarantee that uh, the stuff that they say is what they actually do? And that they, they do it in a straightforward and honest manner. So this institute, institute of reputation, it's institutional reputation. We should uh, boost credibility to the uh, sociologically derived data, no matter what it's, what it's on. And to the, we should develop a different culture of attitude to sociology in the society. This is not something you can get to people very quickly. It's just a symmetrical uh, method. For example, we can say that, okay, dear government, you give us a, a a data, data array of 10,000 people, uh, you've asked God knows whom about uh, more or less God knows what, and you've given us this data. Okay, we'll give you another one. And we, we, can, we can just uh, try to reciprocate this uh, fake trial, fake opinion poll. Sound is a bit garbled here. Uh, the Institute of Reputation, uh, so, uh, social, stu social studies organizations should be reputable bottom line. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the social data will be used as uh, tools in the informational warfare. The social studies will be used as that. So mutual support and uh, mutual credit granted to each other. This is the way out of the situation. We're running out of time here. Thank you, Oksana. Uh, Wojciech, a few points. What about this Institute of Trust, Institute of Reputation? 
and the use of sociology differently in the information warfare. Clearly, the Belarusian uh, situation is different uh, from the Polish one, but uh, there are many forces in Poland as well who are interested uh, to leverage sociology uh, for their purposes. Uh, what can the Polish uh, public uh, use to oppose that, using social studies uh, for, as propaganda? What can you cite? The insights, the conclusions. Well, to build on what Oksana has said, let me start with that. I quite agree that uh, two main objectives uh, were put forth uh, before that big ABPA uh, opinion poll. First of all, is the attempt to legitimize uh, the regime because they feel the lack of uh, legitimacy. And it's also an attempt uh, to respond uh, to other polls uh, that have been published over the past months. They say, okay, how many guys you have? Uh, 1,000? Okay, we'll give you 10,000. So this pseudo poll, this quasi poll, well, I don't think we should uh, focus our attention on it uh, that much. The most important thing is, is not that opinion poll, is the reprisals, oppression, pressure against the society, unprecedented one at that. So as for your question, uh, Vadim, uh, the confidence, the trust, it's very important. I also do, I also deal with Ukraine. I know institutions institutes in Ukraine that uh, study public opinion that can be trusted and those who can't. There are those with a brand and there are those who are just for show, who, who have been bought and paid for. Over the past years, when there were new ratings of political popularity by parties, uh, by political leaders of those parties, it was very visible. Uh, so reputation is very important. Uh, the situation in, in Belarus is different from that in the European Union. Obviously, it's uh, incomparably different. It's not even comparable to Belarus or Russia, where uh, there is a Levada center in Russia. Although the stuff that they get and they, they publish in their uh, opinion polls, uh, outcomes, so it's, it's, they're also raising questions. So I believe that, uh, in a nutshell, this is an attempt by the Belarusian regime to try to confirm their legitimacy by, by this poll. But it's a completely failed attempt, from my point. Thank you, Wojciech. Okay, so if we don't, uh, if we're not to run behind in time, we will have 10 minutes, uh, give or take. Now we can initiate that discussion. Yuri Drakakrust had a question. So if you're with us, uh, please feel free to ask that question. His camera is off. Or whoever wishes to ask a question, just raise a hand, like Dmitry Karenko has said in the app. Anton, I'm off my phone, I cannot see the picture. Can you please have a look whether anyone wishes to join the discussion right now? Well, there were, there were questions in the chat box, so I'll just go one by one to Pavel Zerko. Fear affecting the honesty in questions. Can we uh, be sure that the internet is resolving that question? Yeah, the fear for, for every opinion poll particularly when the uh, opposition leaders had worse ratings than now, uh, there was an argument that everybody was afraid uh, to, 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 to tell the truth, who, who likes them. I see Gennad, I see Philippe uh, unmuting themselves. Can you comment on that briefly? Because it's, yeah, we've seen that a lot. Gennad, Philippe, who, who is ready? Okay, in a nutshell, here's how it goes. It's important to understand the context of this question. As Vadim has correctly pointed out, it's it's not a new thing. Uh, Nisepi was also oppressed against uh, by 
the people who are referred to as the old opposition these days. Yeah, there was a bankruptcy, the social studies are impossible, everybody is afraid to say how much they hate the dictator, and so on and so forth. So this is all, this all needs to be embedded into the temporal context as well. Now use, using the telephone uh, interviews, uh, it will give a huge bias because uh, the scale of the reprisals is uh, completely unwound. I mean, anybody can be blamed for anything. People who see police batons in the street every day, they read every day the news how people get imprisoned for nothing, over nothing, over uh, some innocent statements, or some, uh, some, some stuff they put out. Uh, yes, yeah, they get imprisoned for a long time. In this case, uh, internet is better than the phone. It's, it's coping with the problem of fear better. The online panels that invite people to uh, participate in the poll, they, they've existed for a long time. People like uh, Nordstadt say, uh, Nordstadt says that people who have been in this online panels, they, they, they trust uh, this online stuff, modern uh, telephone. Face to face is out of question. Well, it's, it's not the time for those. Uh, previously, the reprisals uh, were used only for a very specific uh, group of people. Uh, the issue of fear was not as relevant as is widespread. I don't have issues with Nisepi because uh, they had very low uh, ratings of opposition leaders, and uh, Lukashenko's uh, rating was much higher simply because of the fear factor. But right now, the fear factor does play a role, and the internet. Uh, polling helps avoid that. And, and it's not just me thing, saying that, There's, there are pieces of research corroborating that. Gennad? Yeah, I would agree with uh, Philippe here. I, I'd like to display solidarity with Philippe here, because traditionally face-to-face -face, uh, and the questionnaire face-to-face -face and the telephone I believe uh, the awareness of protection of, uh, of the safety and the safety means that the person can uh, speak their mind freely without uh, being afraid for the consequences. It's, it's mostly online polls. Mm -hmm. People people are less afraid online. Okay, right, Andre. Andre, you're unmuted. Okay, so it's a small comment from me if, in that case. Well, it's clear that will, there will be some distortions, not just because of fear, but of, because of our human emotions. You don't know what kind of sen what kind of questions questions are going to prove sensitive to that or another person. So there are biases there as well. This is not a problem of uh, it being there. It's it's the problem that we cannot assess the magnitude of that factor. Uh, the situation like ours. I don't want uh, to re refer to it as a war, somebody calls it uh, internal occupation. Well, quite a bunch of people live uh, uh, sensing this occupation these days. And this opinion poll that I've seen recently, I cannot refer to it openly. Uh, the feeling of safety, uh, well, Belarusians no longer feel safe. It's very low. Uh, they are no longer safe in their own homes, which has never been the case because uh, my, my, my home is my fortress has always been the, has always been the case. Being protected in the private space uh, was always there. Whereas public spaces were kind of shaky, uh, kind of thin, trend, trading on thin ice. Uh, the, the sanctity of the homes uh, were, were, were there for the people. And in our case, uh, well, it, it was like that. Now it's, it's no longer the case. This overall level of fear, anxiety, of lack of protection is quite high, and it affects pretty much everything. The more anonymous you get, the more the, the bigger the distance between the interviewer and the interviewee, uh, the more hopes we have, we will have uh, that uh, it's actual opinion of the respondents uh, rather than the rather than what they want us to believe about them. Uh, a person, an interviewer that they've seen for the first time and don't know. So online tools uh, is, indeed, is indeed a part of our toolkit, one of the main 
parts of our toolkit. Of course, the limitations must be remembered and they should not be hidden because, again, it, it, it can backfire at our reputation, for our reputation. It undermines, might undermine trust to our data. Andre, in a nutshell, three points. Three points uh, with respect to the question answered. Sensitive and non-sensitive questions. Let's not talk about the rating bits, the rating things. Economic, uh, well, ec economic uh, questions. The telephones can also record that when there is the dynamic uh, going, the economy going worse, uh, going from bad to worse. Uh, people are not afraid to to, uh, to to say about that even on the phone. I've shown that many times, as, as well as the negative. Well, to, in March, April, uh, people started complaining of the bad economy. Social desirability effect, uh, the effect of fear. Uh, the dynamic is this, and it's very sad. Compared to summer, July, August, uh, the refusal rate uh, in December doubled. The rejections went up twofold from July, August to December. Online panels, second point, and the two sub points here. We're talking about different things. Selecting the respondents in every particular case. When the res respondent is reached at, is, is reached uh, multiple times, not just uh, not talking all about online, uh, on the phone and uh, on or face to face, and forming a panel. And I'm getting to my second sub point about the panel uh, about the forming the panel. So it's not measuring the social consciousness, consciousness. it's uh, measuring, it's gauging the expert opinion. A person on the panel knows that, he, that they will be asked questions. For this reason, their media behavior changes. It's a more aware, it's a person more aware as to the questions, anticipated questions, anticipated by, by, by him or her. They simply know more about uh, the, the, these matters compared to the average Belarusian. The average Belarusians uh, are the ones uh, that build up uh, the mass consciousness. This is how uh, the political or so sociological polls is different from the economic, po economic uh, panel. Sales in marketing, where there is a certain picture of marketing behavior of pattern is drawn of marketing behavior per pattern of a person is drawn and uh, the people who are on the panel uh, they inside inside the minds they become the experts and not uh, the, the unbiased respondents uh, they would have been any hands any questions in the chat box yeah, there is a question to Andrei Vardamatsky in the chat box uh, from Yuri Dukakhrust. So, Andrei, uh, you've assessed uh, uh, the lack of the demand uh, to presence of a leader as a positive one. The, the, the leaders change, uh, the leaders come and go, uh, but we see uh, the outcome. We see the outcome and it's not a good one. Uh, so. Uh, we already know the result, albeit uh, a preliminary one, and this is not a victory. Uh, could this be related to the situation with the leaders? A tough analogy, but Carnival uh, also has no leaders. But the Carnival has no intention of taking power. Well, uh, I just uh, wanted to emphasize uh, the lack of psychological desire for a leader. And that's because uh, people knew exactly what's going to happen uh, to a leader uh, if if they surface, if they emerge. Uh, they know exactly what, what's going to happen to that leader in two weeks or a month uh, from the time they try to act as a leader. 
That's the first point. The second point, essentially, there were two stages of these relations. Uh, the, the things I was referring to was true for September, October, and uh, the August itself. Then the situation changed. There was a need in the leaders. The demand for leaders was for their programs, not the presence, but for their platforms. But there, is, there was a trend. There is a trend here. The outcome, well, you know the outcome. So you, you see what I'm getting at. There were two stages of uh, standing towards leaders. First is a lack of the presence, and then starting October, uh, the request uh, for messages, for, plat for a platform, for clear action plan from, from the leaders. Okay, thank you, Andre. It's clear. Okay, so getting back to Navalny, the Rick and Morty philosophers, everything's going to be fine in the end. If, if it's not fine, uh, maybe it's not the end. Okay, so maybe somebody else uh, wishes to ask a social studies related question. Our discussion is nearing its end. There is a question from Dmitry Karenko in the chat box. Hello? How many independent uh, opinion polls have regularly working and publishing the results during the electoral campaign and after it, after the past six months? Are these the services that Andrew Gordomaski has been talking about, or are there, are there more? And also saw uh, Philip's, Philip's hand. Maybe he wishes to respond. Philip, please. Zero, zero opinion polls. I think there were some opinions of some uh, informal leaks into Telegram of uh, dubious authorship. There was a Telegram channel, Trikatash, that was claiming something about what ARI was doing. The Nectar channel featured the information. Again, somebody collected something on an, uh, in an online poll. And that's about it. This is where the open data ends. Zero opinion polls. After the electoral campaign, or maybe Andre has wishes to say something. Maybe, maybe I've missed something. After the electoral campaign, there was more interest. Uh, the interest sparked. Uh, Chatham House came in. But uh, there's not uh, an abundance of open data either way. I believe that the uh, People's Poll, Narodna Pros, Center for Eastern Studies, and Chatham House. In the past 180 days, uh, this, this is what has been collected and published. The Russian sociologist, uh, sociologists uh, said that they researched something and they mentioned that on, uh, during a bunch of Zoom conferences, but I haven't seen a single report. IRI measurements are also being discussed regularly, but it's, it's, it's not ending up in the public domain. If everybody has a link to them, let's get this data out to people. It's, 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 it would be very interesting. It would be very interesting. There's too little information available, too little publicly available information. So if I forgot something, please feel free to elaborate. Well, I don't remember IRI people uh, listing out, uh, uh, registering to our club, but let's ask Andre. Yeah, the way this poll is conducted, there's no country like that. Well, maybe with the exception of Estonia, there's no country around the borders of Belarus. That hasn't launched uh, research like that. There was quite a bunch of Russian-led uh, polls. Sociology, like I said, is like internet. It cannot be stopped. And in this case, uh, domestic players do not have to be involved, even. Uh, the countries uh, 
to do this research for the for themselves and they, everyone knows everything okay thank you Oksana so yeah we can, we can talk about maybe a dozen of, of polls of the kind getting back to the question yeah ultimately we'll end up having more information as to what's been happening in Belarus over this time because the information and the messages that the uh, polls were run they, they were being carried out or are being carried out uh, there's too many words and too few reports in the public domain in this case Philippe has indeed listed everything have itemized everything maybe some, some comments uh, some some experts that that refer to the studies they've allegedly made uh, they would publish those reports i'll just correct that before the electoral campaign before the election day uh, the narod uh, the public poll was was the project was running they were trying to paint a picture in a more or less quality way they published it post factum though and there was another mysterious enigmatic enigmatic in terms of quality made they tried to anticipate the electoral situation there was a limited publication before the elections it basically showed uh, that it was possible to openly publish this kind of stuff because uh, the, there are organizations that can run the polls but uh, they are deprived of the opportunity to publish that pu publicly yeah there, there was a choice study uh, there were looking at the moods to the protests and they published it they've published it recently and i guess i guess the choice uh when they when they studied youth they wanted to look into the participation of uh, the youngsters under 30 uh in the protests well that's it then that's about it i will not argue the fact that they're run and andre is correct somebody's collecting this data because there's there's no smoke without a fire and hopefully we'll be able to have a look at this data sooner rather than later yeah and that's another aspect about the drama or theatrical stuff that I've mentioned this lack of uncertainty about this data okay maybe Gennad wanted to elaborate I'm not a social scientist uh, but I guess Gennad's case is uh, is one rare case when his data was open was made public by by a state-owned organization not because uh, the government wanted it but that 24 percent for minsk approval ratings uh, they they've seen it because of you yeah that case was exceptional there was a leak of information indeed but i'm 1000 uh, percent sure that it did not come from the institute of sociology in belarus I'm 1000% sure. This was my intention in the first place. I never cited the figures that the Institute never received. But if uh, the Institute did receive figures, I was free to quote them. I was free to quote, quote them. Another bit uh, that list uh, that you've painted uh, Philippe, uh, uh, Oksana. Andre, with this uncertainty, the gray, the shady zone, he contributed that as well. I, I don't have much to elaborate beyond that, unfortunately. Okay, Anton, if there are no burning questions, we should call it a night because our time is running out. We've uh, exhausted the agenda. We've overdid a bit on time. A wonderful burning topic up for discussion, indeed because there's a huge gray zone indeed that we can only judge about uh, based on some hearsay some indirect hearsay and there's, there's something going on in the gray zone but nobody saw it happening not, 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 well so somebody has seen it happening but nobody had anything to show for it yeah that, that gray zone is the, the, the highest quality from, from the viewpoints of uh, compliance with the procedure well I would really love to familiarize with, with the procedures but it's too great for that it's 40 by 40. I, I've, I've heard these figures time and time again so I arise on telephone 40 Lukashenko 40 percent of the Tikhanovskaya 
this is all very weird. This is all uh, well, mind-boggling. I would really like to have a look at this uh, piece of research in a more detailed way. I I won't subscribe to their quality. We just know that they're, they're running something. Right. So getting back to the reputation, getting back to the trust issue that we've brought up today time and time again, this is indeed a problem. Because we've heard that multiple times, not just about the social studies, those secretly collected data that the government allegedly has. So the more mysteriously they're collected, the better this information is, the higher quality it is. Well, that trust uh, has never materialized to that data because we don't say we don't know the origin. Anyway, I believe that we've covered a great many important questions, issues today. I would like to thank everyone who participated in our discussion, our keynote speakers, our guests. Thank you very much. All those who have tuned in, all those who have asked questions. Thank you so much. We're always pleased to see you guys there and possibly, well, until we see each other again at the new expert analytical clubs. Yes, every, everyone watching us on YouTube, uh, please feel free to subscribe to uh, our channel. Hit subscribe, hit like, and hit the notification bell. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. It's been, it's been an interesting experience.